As the 70s were coming to a close, the DeMeo crew was going about business as usual. Their car theft, loan sharking, and drug businesses were as profitable as ever, and their murder activities had reached its zenith. One of DeMeo's loan shark customers, Charles Padnick, was connected with a Cuban drug dealer named William Serrano, who was in a crew headed by a man only known as El Negro. During a trip to Miami in 1979, Padnick had introduced Rosenberg to Serrano, and they did a trial run of one kilogram of cocaine. On March 17, 1979, El Negro had sent Padnick, William Serrano, Serrano's cousin, and his girlfriend to New York to meet with Rosenberg to facilitate a deal for 12 kilograms of cocaine. However, Rosenberg had no intentions of paying for the drugs. At some point during their meeting, Rosenberg pulled out his gun and began firing on all four of them. But one of the Cubans was able to get off a grazing shot on Chris before being killed. All four of them died on the spot and Chris stole the 12 kilos of coke. This would prove to be a fatal mistake for Rosenberg. Rosenberg had made the mistake of assuming Serrano was behind the deal when it was El Negro pulling the strings all along. El Negro's contacts were instructed to call him when the deal was completed and when he didn't hear back, he knew something was amiss. Charles Padnick's 20-year-old son Jamie, who was aware of the cocaine deal, also knew something was wrong when he didn't hear back from his father after two days. So he hopped on a flight to New York to investigate. After making his way to the Gemini Lounge, Jamie Padnick was never seen again. Another Cuban drug dealer named Pedro Rodriguez, nicknamed Paz, who was part of El Negro's crew, was also involved in the drug and stolen car business with Dominic Montiglio. Paz had approached Montiglio and asked him about a man named Chris DeMeo, who was the one who had set up the cocaine deal with the Cubans. Chris Rosenberg had often introduced himself as Chris DeMeo, and when Montiglio heard the name, he immediately knew it was Rosenberg. Paz let Montiglio know that he had a crew of hitmen ready to go, and threatened an all-out war and murder of their entire families unless Rosenberg was taken out in spectacular fashion, and it made the news. Montiglio relayed this information back to DeMeo and Gaggi, and Gaggi eventually decided that they would have to let the Cubans know that it was Chris Rosenberg. At this time, DeMeo became highly strung out and paranoid and laid low in his Long Island home. One month after the Cuban debacle, an 18-year-old vacuum salesman named Dominic Ragucci had parked nearby DeMeo's home to take care of some paperwork. Ragucci was half Italian and half Puerto Rican and could have passed for a Cuban. When DeMeo noticed Ragucci and his ethnic appearance, he mistakenly believed him to be a Cuban hitman. DeMeo and his cousin Dracula approached Ragucci's vehicle with guns in hand, and when Ragucci saw two armed men walking towards him, he put his car into gear and took off. DeMeo and Dracula then jumped in a car and sped after Ragucci. As they chased the terrified 18-year-old, both of them were shooting at his car out of the windows. After a seven-mile high-speed pursuit through Long Island, Ragucci crashed his car at an intersection. Roy then jumped out of his car and shot Ragucci seven times in front of numerous witnesses, got back in his car, and then drove off. DeMeo soon learned from a newspaper article that the person he killed was no Cuban hitman at all, but rather an innocent 18-year-old. And he knew that his actions could have serious consequences. After this, Gaggi had decided enough was enough and ordered DeMeo to take out his first recruit and friend, Chris Rosenberg, in order to appease the Cubans and avoid an all out war. This appeared to be the only time DeMeo had displayed apprehension in having to kill somebody, but he knew it had to be done. About two months after the double cross of the Cubans, on May 11, 1979, Chris Rosenberg, who was never informed about the Cuban situation, was invited to the Gemini apartment. The unsuspecting Rosenberg was shot in the head by DeMeo and Anthony Center. His body was then placed in a vehicle filled with guns at Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, and this accomplished what the Cubans had wanted. His murder made the news. While the mayor crew victims were popping up and other bloody mob wars were being raised all over the city, the person responsible for performing autopsies on these bodies was none other than Roy DeMeo's cousin, Dominic DeMeo. We've identified six bodies. Six out of seven have been positively identified. And are you certain that these people are from the underworld? Well, there's no other conclusion to, to draw from it since most of these people not only had multiple bullet wounds but were wrapped up and tied and placed in cardboard boxes, uh, shipping uh, boxes and... 
In late 1979, a Gambino capo named James Eppolito told boss Paul Castellano that Gaggi and DeMeo were trafficking drugs and asked for permission to kill them. However, Castellano sided with DeMeo and Gaggi and instead relayed this information back to them and allowed them to kill Eppolito. On October 1st, 1979, DeMeo, Gaggi, and three other men had shot and killed James Eppolito and his son while they sat in a parked car. A witness to the shooting had alerted an off-duty police officer who then located Gaggi and one of his cohorts and engaged both of them in a shootout. Nino Gaggi and one of his partners in the shooting, Peter Piacente, were both shot and wounded while DeMeo had escaped. Gaggi was arrested and sent to Rikers Island. According to former FBI agent Art Ruffles, when Roy DeMeo discovered that Nino was sent to Rikers Island, he instructed the crew members to meet at the Gemini Lounge and to bring all of their weapons. They were going to plan an assault of Rikers Island by boat in order to rescue Nino. However, Dominic Montiglio had talked them out of it. Gaggi was initially charged with the two murders and the attempted murder of the police officer, but would only be convicted of assault and sentenced to 5 to 15 years in federal prison. Gaggi's arrest and DeMeo's close call with the police didn't sidetrack the crew one bit. A man named Khaled Daoud was operating a competing but legal venture of exporting cars overseas. He purchased cars from a legitimate car dealer in Long Island named Ronald Falcaro and shipped them to Kuwait. However, Daoud grew suspicious of the amount of vehicles available to their competitor, Ronald Eustica, who was a partner in the DeMeo crew car theft ring. When Eustica had witnessed Daoud writing down VIN plate numbers at one of his storage facilities, he feared that he would divulge this information to authorities. On October 12, 1979, Daoud and Falcaro were both lured to a garage owned by Freddy Denomi under the false pretense that Denomi would sell them an excess portion of his inventory. Once inside the garage, Daoud and Falcaro were both shot dead by members of the DeMeo crew, while Vito Arena was stationed outside as a lookout. As the 1980s rolled around, the FBI's investigations into the DeMeo crew had increased due to the alarming number of missing people linked to the Gemini Lounge and to the car theft ring. The FBI was being fed numerous tips from informants, and they routinely held surveillance of the DeMeo crew. By now, Dominic Montiglio had become addicted to drugs and had also had a falling out with his uncle Nino after Nino accused him of stealing money. So Montiglio took his family and fled to California. In March of 1980, the dirty detective who had been feeding inside information to Roy DeMeo for years, Peter Calabro, was shot dead while driving to his home in Saddle River, New Jersey. His death was said to have been ordered by his ex-wife Carmela's family due to her suspicious drowning death three years earlier, which they suspected Calabro of doing. Richard the Iceman Kuklinski claims to have killed Calabro on the orders from Sammy the Bull Gravano. On July 4th, 1980, Freddie Denomi recorded a DeMeo crew gathering at Roy DeMeo's Long Island home. You started on that camera already, Freddie. This guy is nuts. Alright, Freddie, will you stop? I'm gonna shoot you. later. We're gonna have over here a sucker later. The bridge. I'm taking it down. If you sell fast, you run inside. <laughs> Did you meet my friend Ben? He's one of the Dover brothers. Ben, ben Dover. Dover. It was a nice party, Joe. I'm glad you came yesterday. Oh, hey. I mean, you know, we really missed you. I didn't hear you. What was that, sir? A <laughs> bongo.
it wouldn't be long after this that the crew would begin to unravel. In May of 1981, Henry Borelli and Freddie Denomi were arrested due to their roles in the car theft ring. DeMeo had ordered Borelli and Denomi to plead guilty in order to stop any further investigations by law enforcement into his activities. By now, Roy DeMeo had become extremely paranoid. Law enforcement was right behind him and he believed that a hit had been placed on him. DeMeo even contemplated faking his own death. He even created a fake identity and had set up safe houses in the event that he went on the run. As the investigations into the crew grew stronger and evidence piled up, several crew members would begin to cooperate with authorities. The first to flip was Vito Arena in 1981. He helped them solve three murders, and one of those murders was the 1978 killing of Joseph Scorny, who was Richard Denomi's partner in the car theft ring. Scorny was allegedly killed because he refused to join the DeMeo crew, and he was shot dead by Richard Denomi and Vito Arena. Scorny's body was stuffed into a barrel filled with cement and was dropped off of a Long Island pier. Arena was then put into the witness protection program, but continued his criminal activities, and before he could be arrested again, he went on the land. The crew was shipping their cars overseas from the port of Newark in New Jersey. In April of 1981, a federal customs inspector discovered that one of the cars being shipped had a missing trunk lock, a dead giveaway for a stolen vehicle. Shortly thereafter, the government seized 76 vehicles destined for Kuwait. In July of 1981, Roy DeMeo was served a subpoena by the Newark branch of the FBI as part of a major investigation into the Kuwait auto theft operation, and he was informed that Vito Arena was cooperating against him. In August of 1981, Borelli and Denomi had done as instructed and pled guilty to their roles in the car theft ring, and each was sentenced to five years in prison. Even while all this heat was coming down on them, the DeMeo crew didn't stop their murderous ways and continued killing all the way through 1981. The crew continued to kill suspected cooperators as well as many others. They also added one more member to the crew, Carlo Profeta, who replaced Freddie Denomi as DeMeo's driver. Profeta also served as his bodyguard and was present on several murders. In 1981, Nino Gaggi's sentence was overturned on appeal and he was released from prison. Gaggi had bribed a juror to make false claims of government misconduct during the trial. In June of 1982, authorities had recaptured Vito Arena and charged him with armed robbery and other felonies. Arena once again decided to cooperate and offered up even more damning evidence into the DeMeo crew's activities. While all of this was happening, Gambino boss Paul Castellano feared what would occur with the unpredictable DeMeo and that the car theft ring would be tied back to him. So he decided that Roy DeMeo needed to be taken out. However, Castellano had trouble finding someone to do the job. He approached John Gotti to take care of it, but even the tough Gotti was wary of trying to take out a dangerous killer like DeMeo, who was also surrounded by a squad of killers. So Castellano switched tactics. He would get DeMeo's own crew to turn on him. Castellano had Gambino Capo and John Gotti's close ally, Frank DeChico, approach Testa and Center and inform them that a contract had been placed on their lives as well as the other crew members. DeChico assured them that the contracts on their lives would be relinquished if they helped to take out their boss and mentor, Roy DeMeo. The twins agreed. On January 10th, 1983, Roy DeMeo had apparently met with his uncle, the assistant DA, Albert DeMeo. The purpose of this meeting was reportedly to get some of his estate and will affairs in order, and it may also have been to get more information about the investigation into him and his crew. Later that same day, DeMeo went to a meeting at Patty Tester's garage. DeMeo barely had his coat off when Gaggi and the Gemini twins pumped seven bullets into his head and body. That night, when DeMeo failed to show up for his daughter's birthday party, it had concerned his family. That evening, Roy's son Albert had found several of Roy's personal belongings in his home study that he never left home without, and along with these was a Catholic pamphlet. Albert claims that his father knew he was about to be killed and had gone to confession beforehand. DeMeo's body wasn't discovered until 10 days later on January 20th, 1983. 
His bullet-riddled corpse was found in the trunk of his car at the Varuna Bolt Club in Brooklyn. After the killing of DeMeo, Joey Testa and Anthony Center were transferred to the Lucchese family. The Gemini twins continued their roles as hitmen for the Lucchese's. Patty Testa continued his involvement with the auto theft ring. Authorities were now catching up to the remaining DeMeo crew members. In 1983, Dominic Montiglio had returned to New York from California to collect the loan shark debt and was arrested by the FBI. Unbeknownst to Montiglio, his loan shark customer had informed the NYPD that he was being extorted by him, and the NYPD in turn passed that information along to the FBI. Soon after discovering that his uncle Nino had put out a hit on him, Montiglio would also begin to cooperate with the government. Montiglio offered up incriminating evidence on Nino Gaggi and the DeMeo crew, and his information would lead to the indictment of Gaggi and boss Paul Castellano. In 1983, the old crook, Joseph Dracula Guglielmo, was arrested at the Gemini apartment. Not long after his arrest, Dracula disappeared and was never seen again. Some believe he was killed out of fear that he would cooperate, but Roy DeMeo's son Albert claims that he dropped him off at an airport and he was never seen again. Freddie Denomi's younger brother, Richard Denomi, was arrested in early 1984 and released on bail. However, he wouldn't be out on bail long. On February 6, 1984, Richard Denomi was found shot to death along with two others inside his Brooklyn home. A month after the murder of his younger brother, Freddie Denomi decided to cooperate with authorities. As Arena and Montiglio had previously done, Freddy Denomi would provide a wealth of information into the inner workings of the DeMeo crew. During this time, Denomi was also implicated in eight murders. Also in 1984, Paul Castellano was arrested and hit with a 78 count indictment. His charges included car theft, loan sharking, racketeering, and the ordering of numerous murders, including that of Roy DeMeo. He was released on $2 million bail but would never see trial. On December 16, 1985, Paul Castellano was gunned down in front of Spark Steakhouse. The first trial against the DeMeo crew and the Gambinos began in late 1985 with Vito Arena and Dominic Montiglio as the key witnesses. This is footage of Joey Testa, Anthony Center, and Henry Barelli heading to court for their first trial. Montiglio would name his uncle Nino Gaggi as one of the ringleaders of the car theft operation. Montiglio and Arena's testimonies would implicate Henry Borelli and Peter LaFrocia, along with DeMeo associates Ronald Tarikian and Ronald Eustica as being involved in the car theft ring's daily operations. In January of 1986, Denomi would also implicate several other crew members and testified about Anthony Center and Joey Testa as being the ones to murder and dismember Khaled Daoud and Ronald Falcaro in 1979. One juror described Vito Arena as a sleazy, big-mouthed braggart who loved attention and turned off him and the other jurors. Arena was also bad-mouthing Freddy Denomi. He described him as a racist who hated blacks and Jews and used to pull up to bus stops and throw bleach on black people. Arena was apparently doing this because he hated sharing the spotlight with Freddie Denomi and wanted to be the key witness in the trial. That same juror had described Henry Borelli as very likable and that he felt bad about having to convict him. Arena's testimony led to the indictment of 20 other mobsters. In April of 1986, Nino Gaggi was convicted of conspiracy to sell stolen cars and was sentenced to five years in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, but he was also awaiting trial on another indictment of his role in 25 murders committed by the DeMeo crew. Henry Borelli was convicted of murder and car theft and sentenced to life in prison for murder and given 10 years on each of 15 counts of shipping stolen cars. 
The jury declared a mistrial on the murder counts against Joey Testa and Anthony Center, and they were cleared of shipping stolen cars. But soon they would both be brought back to trial. Freddie Denomi was in the witness protection program and was living outside of San Antonio, Texas, working at an auto body shop. In February of 1986, Denomi was found dead by his roommates hanging from a rope. His roommates had cut him down and then robbed him before calling the cops. His roommates then went on the run and warrants were issued for their arrests. On April 17, 1988, while awaiting his second trial, Nino Gaggi died of a heart attack at the age of 62. He had complained of chest pains to the jail guards who ignored his request for medical attention. Gaggi's death sparked a controversy that eventually resulted in better medical conditions in New York City prisons, and his wife successfully sued for negligence. Dominic Montiglio said that Nino always dreamed of dying in the street with a gun in his hand, but his end would come in a far less grandiose manner. The final trial in 1989 would result in Joey Testa and Anthony Center being convicted of multiple murders. Ultimately, Arena, Montiglio, and Denomi's testimonies would get Henry Borelli, Anthony Center, and Joey Testa convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Montiglio's testimonies in various different trials reportedly helped send 56 mobsters to prison. Vito Arena was not allowed into the witness protection program again due to his previous issues with authorities and his bizarre behavior. Arena had demanded that the FBI pay for plastic surgery in order for him to hide his identity, to which they refused. Arena had relocated to Houston, Texas, where he went back to his old criminal ways. On February 15, 1991, Arena attempted to rob a convenience store and was shot in the body several times by a clerk and then died in the hospital a few days later. In 1989, Patty Testa had beaten a man with a baseball bat for attempting to steal radios from some of his cars and was charged with assault but was eventually acquitted. In 1991, Patty joined the Lucchese family where he continued to run his auto theft operation. On December 2, 1992, Patty Testa was in his Canarsie Auto Repair Shop when a gunman entered the shop, approached Testa from behind, and opened fire on him nine times, killing him instantly. As of early 2023, Anthony Center is still alive and is still serving out his life sentence. Joey Testa is also still alive and still incarcerated. As is Henry Borelli. After numerous jail stints, Peter LaFrosha is still alive and now is a free man who can be found on YouTube talking about his history with the DeMeo crew. Carlo Profeta is still alive and continued his life as a mobster. He is still involved in the mob as an acting member in the Lucchese family. It wasn't until the book Murder Machine, written by Jerry Capisi and Jean Mustaine, came out in 1991 that the atrocities committed by Roy DeMeo and his crew were revealed to the general public. Many of the details in this book came from inside knowledge provided by Dominic Montiglio as well as the information gleaned from other informants. Roy DeMeo's son Albert had no clue of the extent of the violent acts that his father had committed until Murder Machine came out and suffered a nervous breakdown after reading the book. Albert DeMeo also wrote his own book called For the Sins of My Father which detailed his relationship with his dad. He paints the picture of a loving and supportive father and family man albeit one who was having him run mob errands for him as a young teen. Roy DeMeo's well-respected prosecutor uncle, Albert DeMeo, was a professor at Brooklyn Law School for almost 40 years until retiring in 1999. He died in 2013 at the age of 101. In the hit TV show The Sopranos, the character of the gay mobster named Vito Spatafor was based off of Vito Arena. 
Roy DeMeo's son, Albert DeMeo, passed away in 2017 at the age of 51. He allegedly committed suicide. Dominic Montiglio passed away in 2021 at the age of 73. In terms of organized crime ventures, Roy DeMeo was up there with some of the most accomplished. He engineered the biggest car theft ring in the history of New York City and brought in vast profits from pornography, drugs, and various other operations. But his murderous ways is what he will truly be remembered for. If the estimated numbers are true, Roy DeMeo has killed more people than many of the most prolific American serial killers. From 1975 to 1983, Roy DeMeo and his crew are suspected of killing at least 100 people, with some estimates being closer to 200. DeMeo was not only a depraved killer himself, but he attracted, recruited, and groomed over a dozen other men who would go on to join his twisted world of killing and dismembering human beings. How Roy DeMeo, the hardworking honor student from an honest middle-class family in Brooklyn, would become the vicious killer that he did, who would chop his victims into pieces and defame their humanity forever, is a question that is impossible to answer. If you're looking for something from Roy DeMeo's background which would explain how he would become the murderer of massive proportions that he did, you won't find it. What we do know is that Roy DeMeo and his crew have gone down as one of the most savage and evil gang of killers we've seen in the mob or anywhere else.